everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Daryl Lum uh, for this Leeward Community College reading. Daryl Lum is a fiction writer and playwright whose work has been one of the pioneering voices of contemporary Hawaii uh, literature. His stories celebrate the everyday lives of people and use of Hawaii Creole English pidgin. But beneath the humor and the laid back nature of his work, lie stories that explore the conflicts and complexities of growing up in an island community. Finding one's identity, reconciling family relationships, and discovering those things that draw us together as a community are themes that run through his stories and plays. He has published two collections of short fiction, Sun, Short Stories and Drama, and Pass On, No Pass Back, which was awarded the Asian American Studies Book Award in 1992. His work has been widely anthologized and frequently used in English, speech, and Asian American Studies classes in secondary and college classes throughout the state and nation. He has seven plays produced by community and youth theater companies, most recently, Plantation Fire was produced in 2016 as part of Honolulu Theater for Youth's show about the closing of the last sugar plantation in Hawaii. And David Car Carradine, not Chinese, <laughs> produced by Kumukuhua Theater in 2005. His latest play, The Beer Can Hat, based on his short story, will pre be produced by Kumukuhua in 2019. He received the Hawaii Award for Literature in 1996, the, Hawaii, um, the state's highest award for literature, the Kate Award in 1991, and the NEA Literature Fellowship for Fiction in 1989. He, along with Eric Chalk, co-founded Bamboo Ridge Press in 1978 and served as co-editor for 35 years. He also served as the editorial consultant to Aloha Shorts, a radio show produced by Hawaii Public Radio, uh, KP, uh, sorry, KIPO FM 89.3, <laughs> featuring selections from Bamboo Ridge Press publications read by local actors. He earned a doctorate in education from the University of Hawaii, and prior to his retirement, worked as an academic advisor to first-generation college students in the Student Support Services Program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Please welcome Daryl Lum. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, thank you all for coming to see an old Chinese guy read stories about a time probably way before any of you were born. Um, so you'll indulge me. Um, I believe some of you read the short story Beer Can Hat uh, from, um, from your textbook. Um, I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about that story, which is 45 years old, something like that. Um, uh, and, and so you have to understand it in the context of you know, when the story was written and um, that those, those, those particular times. Um, uh, more recently, I worked on a script of transforming the beer can hat into a stage play. Uh, and that turned out to be a challenge because how do you turn, first of all, a 40 plus year old short story that's, you know, 10 pages long into a full length play. So I thought I'd start out by reading a little bit of both. So I'll read the first page of the beer can hat, and then um, Anne and I will read a selection from the play script. The beer can hat. 
You know, Bobo stayed low, low in the head. Mental, you know. But he good fun sell newspaper and he smart for go by the cars when he gets stopped light and sell to the ladies, old ladies, and to the mooks who tell stinking stuff about he belong in Kaneohe Hospital like that. But in the end, they buy newspaper and they tip too. Most times they give quarter and tell, keep the change. But sometimes they give more. Bobo, he smart for time of good him. He take long time get change for quarter at the red light. Bombada light change green and the guys tell, hey, that's okay, keep him. And Bobo smile big and tell, thanks, eh? He time him real good. Me, every time I get the real Chiang Kai guys and oh man, they wait till the light turn red again for get their 10 cents change. Coming home from work time is the best time. I go after school, sell papers with Bobo. I'm supposed to go straight after, but I stay full around school a little while because Bobo always stay there and watch my papers for me. Mr. Cavallo, my district manager, get pissed off, but he no can do nothing. Nobody like work for him already. He gets smart with me, I would tell him, hey, no make like that. I know one time you went dump all the inserts inside one big garbage can because it was late and nobody came for help put them inside the home deliveries. That's what I would tell him. Yeah, you know. One time I went and asked Bobo, what he do during the daytime when I go to school? He tell he go by the supermarket and wheel the cart around. Used to be he wheel him around inside a store, but the manager tell him no can. So he wheel him around outside in the parking lot. I asked him what he's saving up for, and he tell, one moto bacon, just like motorcycle that. Tired pump my bike. Bobo's bikes, they all junky, old style, gooseneck, one speed, and one old newspaper bag hanging from, hanging from the handlebars. What's shady? Me, I stay saving up for one skateboard, cobra kind with heavy duty trucks and one college education. That's what my father tell me. So me and Bobo stay together pretty good. Plenty guys tell, why I stay with Bobo? They tell he talk crooked, his mouth funny kind, and sometimes drool a little bit. I tell, watch out, brah. He know kung fu and he make like the wrestler, the missing link. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> but I won't show him how to wipe his mouth before he sell newspaper to the customer. I went buy him handkerchief too. I wanted the kind with initials on top, BB for Bobo. But I couldn't find, so I went buy him one with W, I think, at sidewalk sale. Make him feel good, boy. I feel good too, though. He learn good, wipe his mouth before he go to the customer. He not talk too good. Every time guys tell, huh, what you talking stupid? He only can try his best, but no come out clear. 15 cents paper. But me, I used to do it already. Okay. So that's the, from the original story, yeah? Um, by the way, I, I should add, in those days, newspaper was 15 cents. <laughs> All right? It's like, wow, how do you change from a quarter? Okay, so um, here's the start of the play. And, and you may recognize a, a, some of the, the references from the short story. Um, uh, I don't think you need to know too much except, oh, I should ask. I forgot to ask. You guys know what a beer can hat look, looks, looks like? Yes, yeah, I do. You want to explain? It's like, um, like knitted, like pushed straight with yarn, and they cut the beer cans in half, and they, they make the hat, like primo beer. Oh. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. My, my, my grandmother had one. Your grandmother had one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I get one. This used to be really cool. That was <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody in school had to have one. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, so I have to bring the visual aids these days because it is not. What kind of beer is that on that on that hat? This one is Oli. Oli, okay. This was the the um, beer of choice. Um, what else do you need to know? Oh, there's a reference in here. You guys used to play marbles. Yeah. yeah. What did you call the biggest marble? Bambucha. Oh. 
Okay. This is a bombucha. Yeah. Uh, some, some people call it uh, a shooter. Uh, some people call it bambula. Okay. And, and the, the clear ones, and some, some of them are colored, were, were called puris. Okay, so that's the reference in the, in the play that, uh, in the segment that, that, that we'll read. Okay, come on, Anne. There's not much you need to know except. Um, oh, uh, Bobo and Junior, um, they're playing marbles in front of Ching's store. What kind of marbles do you wish you had? I don't know. Just plenty of puris and plenty of bambuchas. Oh, wait, wait. By the way, um, you have Anne's reading oh, yeah. Bobo. I'm Bobo. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm reading Junior. Okay. <laughs> Would be neat if had bombucha puris, yeah? No such thing. Come on, your turn. Besides, ball bearing more better. Yeah. Nah, puri bombuchas. So sharp would be, so clear and see through. Everything small and upside down. I wish I had puri bombuchas. Sometimes, you know what, neat? I line up all the puris by the window and wait till the light shine through and the stuff make colored light on the floor. Come sharp, man. And if you look inside them, just like they little crystal balls. Can see everything inside each one. Can see everything, the whole world, inside each one. You know, Bobo stayed slow in the head. But I don't mind, because he good fun sell newspapers. I go after school, fold my papers, and get ready for deliver. Supposed to go right after, but Bobo stay there and watch my papers for me. He sell at Ching store and go in the street for sale. My father no let me go in the street to sell. So I just got to do the home deliveries. Mr. Cavallo, my district manager, get pissed off when I come late, but he no can do nothing. Nobody like work for him already. He gets smart with me, I would tell him, hey, I seen one time you went dump all the inserts inside the big garbage can because the papers was late and the delivery boys all had to go home and you had to do all the home deliveries yourself. That's what I would tell them. Yeah, you know. What'd you get? My marbles. Hey, no come so close. What a plenty you get. Where you get them from? I win them, of course. How you get so many big kind? That's my bambuchas that. And these my puris, the small kind, and I keep my kini in one special bag with my puris. This my best shooter, this kini. You like play? Shoot. How you like play? Regular or bambucha style? What bambucha style? Play only with bambuchas. Even your kini gotta be bambucha. And then when pow, I take all the bambuchas I win win. And if you like them back, you gotta give me five regulars for one bambucha. And then pretty soon, you know more nothing regular kind. I get, and I get all your bambuchas. And you gotta steal marbles from your, the school aquarium. And then they catch you and you get lickings. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Hey, junk like that. Play regular. How many in inside? Uku billion. No, act how much? Five, well. Okay, five. How many spams can? One. No, two hand spans. Two then. And no funny, and no, no Samoan style. <laughs> Shut up. I no cheat. And, and, and no only put junk kind marbles in the middle. Got to put two periods inside and then the junk kind, a cat's eye kind. Junk and poke uh, go first. Junk and poke. Slow hand, slow hand. Again, two out of three. Jump can a pull. I can't show. Jump can a I win. What is that? Atomic bomb beat everything. <laughs> no such thing, you cheater. Again, again. Jump can pull. I can show. Jump can pull. Shit, you go then. <laughs> Bobo, customer. 15 cents, please. Here, I only have a dollar. Oh, dollar. Try wait, try wait. Nickel, that's five cents, yeah? Okay, dime, that's 10 cents, eh? Whole quarter, 25, eh? Okay, that's 35. No, 40 cents so far. Hey. That's okay, keep them. Bobo, 
You know how to make change. What you doing? I know. Oh, you sly bugger. <laughs> how come? You first meet a guy going to wait a long time to get his change. Mr. Change said, you come real early. Uh, uh, you come real early nowadays for sell papers. You don't go to school. I go sometimes. Yeah, for eat lunch. My father said, more better drop out, go work. No sell papers after school. He tired of the school calling him up every time. But what you do then before Mr. Cavallo bring the papers? Sometimes I go to the supermarket, the wheel, wheel the cart around, look at all the things for buy. But the manager follow me around, tell me I bothering the other customers, so he kicked me out. Not. So what you do? I wheel the cart around outside in the parking lot. Sometimes I find some beer bottles or soda bottles, and sometimes I bring the carts back. But I know the managers, they're watching me through the glass door. You know, trust, eh? What you gonna buy? One better bike? I gonna get one moped. Tired pump my bike. Moped? Oh, you gotta sell plenty of papers for that. Your father gonna give you the money. No. What you saving for? Skateboard, Cobra kind, with good wheels, heavy duty aluminum trucks, and one college education. That's what my father tell me. Skateboard, Cobra kind, with the good wheels, heavy duty aluminum trucks, and one college education. Oh, you gotta sell plenty of papers for do that. <laughs> okay, we'll stop there. Thank you, Ann. So you see how, how el other elements um, have to be introduced uh, to the story in order to um, um, carry the, uh, what is eventually the, the, the conflict between um, Bobo and his father and the relationship between Junior and, and, and Bobo. So hopefully it, it works out. Um, okay. I thought it would be fun to read a section from, um, from a short story um, that is based on, I understand this is like a autobiography class, right? Um, and although I'm a fiction writer, and, and you know, um, a lot of what I write about is based on experiences growing up or relationships you have with, with your family. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, most of my work starts there. Um, uh, although. When, when your family asks you whether or not that's them, I always deny it and say, no, I, I only write fiction, you know. Uh, 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 I, I once uh, asked um, Maxine Kingston about, about that because her first book was called A Memoir. Uh, because the publishers thought it would sell better that way. But it actually was a work of fiction. So I asked her about it, and she says, well, in the end, no matter what you call it, uh, if it's completely fiction, your family sees themselves in your characters. <laughs> and if you, if you say that it's, it was based on them, they say, no, that's not me. So you can't win either way. Anyway, this is com comes from a story called Aunties and Uncles. Um, and it is based on um, kind of a memory of an uncle and how he spoke. Um, the event itself is, are, is, is fictional. Um, but see what you think. Let me get some more. So the story is called Aunties and Uncles. This section is called Avocado's Number. When I get to his house after school, Uncle Singh 
while he weed in the garden. Don't come around tonight, bound to take your life. There's the bedroom on the right. Bad moon on the rise, uncle. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, yeah, credence song. There's the bedroom on the right. He sing again and point to the right. Ever since I started wearing thick glasses in the fifth grade, Uncle Hung called me professor. I walk to his house after school and wait for daddy to come pick me up after work. I was supposed to do my homework, but sometimes uncle like read my books. He said he gonna help me with my homework, but mostly he just like read my science or my math textbook. About once a week, uncle tests me. Professor, how you figure the circumference of one circle? Pi R squared, I tell, trying to do my homework. Wrong, he slap his leg and tell, pi are, pi are not square, they round. <laughs> and he hop around laughing at his own joke. <laughs> Me, I heard him before, more than once, from uncle. And what you call when you catch the bus and you end up Ever Beach instead of Waikiki Beach? I don't know, uncle. You ain't catch the wrong bus. Get it? Wrong bus. <laughs> Uncle read from my geometry book. 3.1415. You keep reading the digits. 9265355. Why they got to have so many numbers? Non-repeating decimal, Uncle. Never going to stop. The number no end, eh? The bug will go on and on. Yep. Non-repeating. He stay quiet. He must be reading the book. But how they know for sure the thing no repeat? By now I know can do my homework because now I'm thinking about it too. How they know for sure? What if someplace down the line the thing repeat? What if they just never go far enough? He reads some more. The book says, because pi one irrational number. No make sense. Yeah, uncle, that's irrational. No make sense. He no catch. When I went McKinley, same thing. Catch the bus to his house, he still like helped me with my homework. Uncle work at Waldron and sell animal feed and fertilizer. He keep telling me about fertilizer. You know what is 20, 20, 20? What is 15, 30, 10 good for? Maybe that's why he liked chemistry so much. Uncle never take chemistry in high school. He said he was too dumb and they put him in ag class, agriculture. He said, that's what a guy's too stupid to study, so he, they gotta work outside and grow corn and cabbage and green onions. And then they all go to the, and, and then they go to all the classrooms and sell corn to the, um, and sell corn like that once a month. Maybe that's why he sell fertilizer these days. He take the chemistry book from my hand. You're not using this, eh? Guess not. Uncle Hong like read my books. Only thing, he skip around and ask me stuff that we never learned yet. Or he asked me stuff that uh, we went learn long time ago, so I never, so, so I went forget already. So I got to read and explain to him. So, Professor, avocado's number, what kind of number that? 6.02 uh, 6 times 10 to the 23rd. That's one big number. 23 zeros big, I tell him. Bigger than Ukubilian, I guess. What that for, avocado number? Avogadro, for measure gas. Oh, like gallon gas. More like your fat gas, uncle. <laughs> Who like measure my fat gas? He stop and, and tell, put my finger, put my finger. <laughs> he pull his own finger and fat and go, ah, avocado. Avogadro, uncle. Avogadro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Avocado. To good him. So he went invest. So so what he went invent? One mole. I thought one mole was one animal. Mainland get that moles. Over here, no more. No more moles. Get mongooses. If one local guy went invent the number, maybe it would have been called mongoose instead of mole. He put down the book thinking about the idea. Uncle Hung's number for measure mongooses. Sound good, eh? 
I still cracking up even if I don't like encourage him because now even when I go home, I still got to do homework. Rational or irrational, Uncle Hung, Hung's number, I asked him. Irrational. Oh, sorry. Rational or irrational, Uncle Hung's number, he asked me. Irrational, Uncle. Gotta be irrational. No you study already. I thought so. We go eat ice cream. He get the ice cream, two scoops in one bowl for, uh, for me, one scoop for him. We sit by the altar. I do the usual f uh, first before eating. Bow three times and pour a little tea and gin in the pan. Bow three times again. Uncle look at the picture of Apo and Agung, the incense burning behind the five teacups, five small cups liquor, small statue of Kuan Yin. He tell me, Plenty things irrational. Numbers, this kind of Chinese stuff. You don't know for sure if true or bullshit. But still yet, you do them because you don't know, just in case. Apo used to go to the temple and pray for everybody, especially you. She throw the fortune sticks and if no come out good, she just throw them again until come out good. <laughs> she no come home until she get one good one for each grandchildren. She used to say you guys smart because she went temple and pray. And more better, you guys go temple too. I know, nobody like go with her cause we all get the, cause, all, uh, cause get all the incense smoke and the big gold Buddha, kind of scary. And the bullet head monks and, the, and Apo's friend, friends, all the old ladies, they like pinch you in the arm and your cheek and tell, marry Chinese girl, eh? Uncle laugh and eat. She was always thinking about Bombay when you get older. She check out which one of the old ladies get granddaughters. Oh man, yeah. When you were a small kid already, she was, she was setting you up. Now, how long already? But I still do this guy, he point to the altar. I don't know if Apo or Akung know if we still praying for them, no can be sure. Not like one theory get, that get proof. Not like avocado's number. Maybe all for nothing, eh? Poho. Maybe when you die, that's it. Pow. Nothing already. Except us stupid heads burning incense. I eat my ice cream, scrape my spoon on the bottom. But professor, you turn out okay. I think Apo know what she was doing. Maybe Bombay, you're going to get one number named after, after you. Okay, that's it. Um, yeah, so Avocado's number. Um, We're going to end uh, with uh, some selections from um, and really an exercise that I uh, kind of like your class assignment that I gave myself. Um, um, one of the features on the Bamboo Ridge Press website is something called Bamboo Shoots. And it's a monthly writing contest um, that anybody can enter. And there's uh, every month the, the person running the contest puts up uh, writing starters. So it's a whole list of things. That very often it has to do with um, like a holiday that, that month. Um, but there's a catch. And the catch was um, for the longest time, he's, he changes the the rules every now and then. But for the longest time, the catch was your selection had to be based on one of the writing starters and exactly 100 words. Not more, not less, right? And so it's kind of a fun assignment to do, you know? Um, and invariably, you can use it to you know, I'll write other stuff, but it, it was just to get you going. So I thought I would read some of my 100-word um, pieces, and um, 
um, you can see what you think. Uh, a lot of this, I, I think I might need to explain in advance, so I'll, I'll try to make sure you, you get the context because 100 words goes real quick. Um, in December 2017, one of the starters was a uh, nuclear war. And um, ironically, this was prior to the January 2018 false missile alert. Um, so anyway, um, the title of this one is In Case of Nuclear Attack. Once a month, get airway drill. When you hear a siren, you gotta hide under your desk and put your head on the ground. Just like praying at the temple. Andrew tells spooky kind stuff from under his desk. They're going to bomb our school. Phew, boom. Surely, she's bigger than Andrew, but he can make her cry easy. She's asking any kind of questions. Why they like bomb us? What if they hit the jungle gym? She's getting more and more excited, and her desk stay on her back, moving around like one turtle. Where are we going to play? What if? Boom. That's it, 100 words. Um, since it's February, this was uh, my, my selection for uh, Chinese New Year. And the writing starter was just holiday. Uh, I should explain um, that there's a reference in here to little grasshopper. Uh, and if you're not familiar, th this was a, a, a term of endearment um, from a kung fu master to his young student. Okay, and Anne will come help me read this one. Uncle, when is Chinese New Year? Ah, uh, so little grasshopper, let me so consult my calendar. You gotta consult the lunar calendar. All kind of calendar gotta consult. Chinese New Year, sometime January, sometime February. If the Pakis had their, their way, it would be in March too. How come? Supposed to be the new moon in January. Not so fast. You gotta figure all the parameters. Kung hi fa choi no mean Happy New Year. Means wish you get plenty of money. So, no can be on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, cause not weekend. And no can conflict with Super Bowl or Punahou Carnival. Plenty of parameters. Okay, that's 100 words. Uh, so that was February. March was uh, the starter was St. Patrick's Day. Okay, um, and you guys might be familiar with this particular practice. So the uncle is me. So why you gotta wear green? So Andrew no punch me? So you gotta wear green and walk around all day scared that Andrew gonna punch you? Yeah. What about the other days? You are not scared Andrew gonna punch you? No, still scared. So if you wear green today, Andrew not gonna punch you? Maybe. So if you're not even sure he not gonna punch you? Yeah. So you gotta get everybody else no way green. Andrew gonna be the only one wearing green. He gonna think, how come I'm the only one wearing green? Then you can tell him, you're not Irish. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Anne. Uh, where were we, we're March. Um, coming up, May. Mother's Day was the, um, was the starter. Every Mother's Day, my father tell, oh, uh, I need to explain one more thing here. There's a reference to a restaurant called Waikiki Lao Yi Chai, okay? So that's the reference. Every Mother's Day, my father tell, we're going out for dinner. Only thing, he only like to eat Chinese food. Instead of going one regular chop suey house, he tell, we're going Waikiki Lao Yi Chai. My brother tell, 
Okay, we're going Waikiki, lousy chai again. <laughs> we got to wear shoes and nice aloha shirt. When we get there, my father ordered the same stuff as at the Chinese, at, at the chop suey house, only more expensive, and most of the dishes not cheap. The boss sit by the cash register and watch me and Russell like we're going to steal something. Same as chop suey house. <laughs> Uh, and we have time for one more, and then this one, okay. Um, well, I, well, maybe two more here, because they are related. These, these are both from June, which is, um, this first one is, is for Father's Day, and it's called, Think You Can Dance. First time I saw your mother was at the YMCA dance. Oh, she looked like Miss Hawaii. Except when the song start, she hide behind her girlfriends. Finally, when I went dance with her, was just like PE class. She no like whole cl close. She make like she went smell something stink and was me. <laughs> but when the dance was pal, she went hold my hand all the way back. That's how I knew maybe she liked me. So she wasn't Miss Hawaii. Nowadays I call her Miss State. Miss Q, or sometimes Miss Hat. <laughs> no tell her that. <laughs> okay, last one. And will come help me. This is another June one, uh, because I, uh, the uh, starter was honeymoon. You know, uh, June weddings, I suppose. Uh, and once again, there's a reference to a Chinese restaurant called Wo Fat which is a restaurant and not the villain in uh, Hawaii Five-0. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so by the way, um, Lawi Chai and Wo Fat were the two classy Chinese restaurants in Honolulu. So that's, you know. Um, so these are the two voices. Um, and the uh, young speaker. Ho, oh, last night, me and Auntie went Wo Fat and ordered honeymoon shrimp. What's that? They take one broccoli, you like broccoli, eh? And then they make one slit in the shrimp and poke the stem part through the shrimp. Honeymoon shrimp. What's more better than my own honeymoon? <laughs> What's the honeymoon part? Uh, when you marry, you go to church and the minister say, you guys, husband and wife. Then you go vacation. And then you go outside and uh, you look at the moon and say, I love you, honey. And then you uh, go eat honeymoon shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, thank you so much. That's so good, right? Oh, man. Daryl Lum, man. God, he loved his voice, right? Oh, so good, yeah, his stories. OK, so any questions? I know there's a lot of questions, you know, language or you know, the writing process. Anything you want to ask? Um, here's Daryl Lum. I understand that um, if you ask one question, you're going to get A. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Oh, have you ever read in uh, the English, not the pigeon? <laughs> writing the pigeon from the beginning? Uh, the earliest stories when I was in college taking creative writing uh, were in standard English and took place in the characters were like Smith, Mr. Smith, or Jones, and um, one time was set in Chicago. Um, and I was very fortunate to have a teacher who told me, have you ever been to Chicago? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> and in not so many words, he says, you know, I don't want to see this anymore, <laughs> right? And, and there was a lesson about it, having to write from, based on your experience and, and um, people you know, um, you know, you, at least maybe, maybe not writing about real people, but hearing the voices that, that, uh, that speak to you. And so, um, 
I, I do write in standard English once in a while, but it's just more fun, you know, because these are voices that I grew up with and I, and I still hear today in, you know, in, um, in some situations. And, and um, there's this perception, at least when I was growing up, that pigeon speakers were stupid and were ignorant and were incapable of deep thought. As a matter of fact, when I was uh, taking a graduate course in um, pl playwriting, ironically, it was a course called Pigeon Playwriting. A grad, a, a, a grad student told me after reading my script that he believed Pigeon was incapable of conveying the width and breadth of human emotion. And that really got me pissed off. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, so that was the challenge to me. Can I write something that um, is not just comedy? At the time, it was Frank de Lima. Uh, I, you know, and Pigeon was either a, a criminal in, on Hawaii Five O or, or a joke. You know, um, you know. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, I, I heard in the beginning you said something about um, you write um, plays too, like. Yeah. Or do you participate in it? Like you're speaking, you know, or do you have like actors to, to do it? Uh, there are actors, actors. <laughs> I, I once wrote, wrote a play um, called My Home is Down the Street, and it was, uh, the, the main character was ironically another uncle who, uh, had to go to Palolo Chinese home because he, 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 he got to a point where you know, he needed to live there. Um, but he always wanted to go home and his home was down the street in, in Palolo. Uh, that particular character was on stage for almost an entire play, like you know, an hour, 20 minutes. Um, and the director cast the part um, with an actor whose prior ex who, who looked the part, but whose prior experience was um, TV commercials. So like, you know, 30 seconds a minute, right? right? It's real different from being on stage. Um, after, the f after about a week of rehearsal, he said, you know, I can't do this, right? And so the director looked at me and said, would you, 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 you want to do it? I said, oh, no, I can't. I can't even, you know, I can't, uh, you know, I can't even remember my password, much, more, <laughs> um, much less, uh, you know, lines. And as the writer, you know, I would probably want to change the lines as, as, as they go along, so. Um, I, I have no aspiration for an acting career. <laughs> <laughs> well, personally, I think you're fabulous. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like listening to you. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's the voices you hear, right? You know, yeah, it's I like, have oh, you know. <laughs> 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 I think you're wonderful. It's very nice, yeah. Nice Thank you. you. Questions? Will any of your plays be here on Leeward? Like, will you, once you have it all set in stone, do you think you'll have a show here? Um, not as far as I know. The Kumukuhua shows are done at their theater downtown. Um, occasionally, in the summer, they do a traveling show, but that's usually to a neighbor island. Um, so, you know, you can convince the theater department at Leeward to <laughs> consider a script, right? Yeah. Uh, one little aside, my, the very first play that was ever produced was called 
Oranges are lucky. Okay, um, and it's about a Chinese grandmother at her, I don't know what year birthday party. Okay, um, and it was produced by Kumu Kahua, who at the time was. Um, holding their shows here at Leeward. So the first thing I heard was that they were going to produce the show, and then I heard nothing for months. And then somebody called, I don't know how I found out, and said, hey, your play's going to open at Leeward Theater. Right? I said, oh, yeah? And apparently, there's another Darrow Lum in town and they were calling the wrong Daryl Lum to come to the show. <laughs> so, so, so that was fun. It was, uh, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was nice to be, uh, to, to find out that it was, um, that they found the right Daryl Lum. Anybody else? Any advice you have for us? Um, I guess is to try to be as, and this is taken from Lois and Yamanaka, is to try to be as fearless as you can. You know, there's the, there's always that little, there's, there's the writing voice and then there's the editing voice. And you want to shut up the one that says, oh, this is stupid. Oh, this is embarrassing. I don't want to talk about that. You know, that little voice in the back of your head that says you shouldn't or you cannot or, you know. And so you have to be fearless and just write it, you know. Um, worry about the other stuff later on, afterwards. You know, when you got something down on paper, then you can turn on the editing voice and then decide, well, is this something that, you know, uh, I want to work more on, or I want to be out there in the world. You know. Well, thank you all.